Hi everyone, welcome to Frontend Center. For the next two episodes, I want to talk about web font performance. Web fonts are a tricky thing to get right, and there's a lot to cover. Today I want to talk about fallbacks, the font you show before your web font is loaded. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Lookahead for supporting this episode. My favorite way to demonstrate the importance of fallbacks is from a real-world example from early 2015. This is right back at the beginning of the recent US election cycle, where Slate ran this headline. If you're thinking to yourself, I don't remember that happening, you'd be right, they actually ran this headline, but the italicized word not hadn't loaded yet. This is because the word not being italicized is actually rendered using a different font file to the rest of the headline, and for a brief moment, or potentially a long moment depending on your connection, the entire meaning of the headline was reversed. I like this example because it demonstrates a couple of important points around web font usage. One, that each different weight and variant of a typeface is represented by its own file. Two, that those files are fairly large and will take time to load and may fail. And three, that when web font loading goes wrong, it can completely undermine the purpose of your site. It's that last point that's worth dwelling on. Web fonts account for only 4% of the page weight of the average website, and yet without a fallback, they're incredibly disruptive when they fail. A page full of invisible text is not much good to anyone. Contrast this with images, which are far heavier but most of the time aren't as crucial. If a request for an image takes longer than expected, the rest of the site probably works just fine. The site will feel slow but not unusable. Interestingly, the worst offender on this scale is probably client-rendered JavaScript. If you're sending down an empty HTML page and rendering everything with JavaScript, you're now totally reliant on the JS bundle's delivery. And given that the average page now has over 400 kilobytes of JavaScript, that's one of the main culprits of painfully slow web experiences. The answer in that case, of course, is to not serve an empty HTML page. By sending real HTML markup, your site becomes far more resilient to disruptions, be that slow network conditions or broken code. Obviously, this line of thinking leads to the general principle of progressive enhancement, which is a subject all to itself, but not solely relying on client-rendered markup is a good start. For web fonts, we can achieve fault tolerance by providing an adequate fallback font. While the web font is loading, or if it never loads, we provide a perfectly functional operating system provided replacement. It might not look quite as nice as the typeface you've selected and paid good money for, but your users will definitely agree that it looks way better than a blank page. It's worth mentioning that for a lot of sites or apps you might be building, web fonts themselves might not be worth the trade-off. The default system fonts for most operating systems are extremely good, legible, and familiar to your users. But they're not sufficient for all cases, and so if you're going to use web fonts at least some of the time, it's worth knowing how to use them well. That requires two steps. The first is loading the fonts in a consistent way that guarantees that we show the fallback. And the second is making that fallback font look as similar to the eventual font as possible, so that when it loads, it's not too much of a jarring transition. Sadly, loading web fonts consistently isn't as easy as you might expect. While the font face declaration is well supported and straightforward to use, the default behavior of loading fonts in this way is problematic. And it's the reason that so many sites get this wrong. Internet Explorer will show the fallback font immediately, which is great. But other new browsers will show a blank screen for up to three seconds while they're waiting for the web font to arrive. Worse still, Safari and mobile Safari prior to version 10, as well as older Android browsers, will simply wait as long as the web font takes, showing absolutely nothing until it does, if it ever does. Considering older mobile devices might also be on the slowest networks, this produces a terrible experience. We have two options, to either make use of font face but change how the browser loads and renders it, which is what we'll be talking about today, or to load the font files yourself using JavaScript. Google Fonts and Typekit use the latter, and we'll be talking about that next time. For today, though, we want to make use of FontFace's ability to serve different formats based off the browser's capabilities. While virtually every browser supports WAF 1, going back to IE 9, WAF 2 is still only supported in a bit over two-thirds of browsers, having just landed in the latest versions of Edge and Safari. So for the time being, you'll need both. And using the FontFace declaration means we'd leave it up to the browser to decide. The trick now is to prevent the browser from hiding the text while the font file is being fetched. And to do that, we'll use a small JavaScript library. It's worth mentioning that I'm going to be demonstrating just one of the many techniques that are possible for loading things yourself. This is the technique that I think gives the best performance for the least complexity. But if you want to dig further, Zach Leatherman has the best resource and comparison of all the techniques. He's the person who popularized the Mitt Romney example I showed at the beginning as well, and has been working to improve fonts on the web for years. So thanks, Zach.
I'm going to be using Roger Ebert's review of the film North as my example again, because I never get tired of reading it. I'm using Cormorant Garamond for the title and byline, and HK Grotesque for the body. They're both free and really nice to work with, with a lot of weights that look great at a bunch of sizes. If I refresh the page, we can see that it actually takes quite a while to load. That's because I'm running a local web server that's deliberately throttling the font files so we can observe how they render on slow network conditions. I can throttle the connection in DevTools as well, but sometimes it makes things simpler to only slow down one type of asset. If I refresh again, you can see that the different parts of the page actually pop in one by one. This is because each weight and variant is a different file, and they're all being loaded at the same time and drawn as soon as they arrive. We can actually use DevTools to look closer at this process. If we go to the Performance tab, we can record the page load and take an image every time something on the page gets painted. Now we can inspect this timeline to see the exact moment each piece was drawn. Here we can see that the normal body copy gets loaded first, but the links are invisible. Then the normal links appear, then the italicized ones, then the title, and finally the byline. If we want full control over how these fonts pop in, we need to start by preventing the browser from loading the fonts itself, and take matters into our own hands. Looking at our CSS, we're referencing our two fonts, HK Grotesque and Cormorant, with two classes Sans Serif and Serif. The download is actually triggered by these usages, not the font face declarations themselves. If we comment out the Sans Serif font, we see that our typeface has changed, but we're also fetching fewer files. Likewise, if we comment out our Serif, now we're not loading any font files. Our font face declarations are dormant, waiting for something on the page to trigger their download. And this gives us a hook to load things more dynamically. We're going to use a library called Fontface Observer by Bram Stein, another longtime web typography hero. It gives us a simple interface to take fonts that are declared in the CSS but unused and control how they load. I started by listing out the typefaces and variants that we'll be loading. Sadly, there's no way to automatically load all the fonts in the CSS, but that turns out to be really important for advanced use cases. For now, we can just live with the duplication. We simply loop over the typefaces and the variants and create a font face observer for each combination. Calling load returns a promise that resolves when each font is finished loading. If we refresh now, we should see files being loaded. And yep, console messages for each font. Because these are just promises, we can wrap up each set of variants into an array and then do something once they've all completed. Here I'm using promise.all to log once all variants have been loaded. Yep, that's working how we expect. Now we need something to trigger a change in the CSS. We can do that by simply adding a class to the HTML element once all the promises have resolved. We'll just use the name of the font for now. If we refresh, we can see the classes being added to the HTML element as each set of fonts are loaded. Great. The last step is to apply the font family declaration once those classes appear in the document. Refreshing again, we see that the font changes at the same moment the console logs its message. If we do it again, you can see the text jump around, and it's a little abrupt, but ultimately not too bad. It's worse if you're midway through the document, particularly if you're on a mobile device with a small viewport. Then when the text snaps in, you can be pretty disoriented. This brings us to the second part of this episode, tuning the fallback font to look as similar as possible to the final typeface in order to minimize the visual impact of that transition. Thankfully, CSS has quite a few typographic properties that can help us. The first thing we'll need, though, is a fallback typeface. There's a great resource called cssfontstack.com that has some statistics about the proportion of Windows and Mac systems that have a series of common fonts installed. It's not the whole story. You may choose a font here and still find some devices that don't have it, but if you can improve things for the vast majority of your users, then you should. You can play around with these as much as you like, but for today, I'm going to keep it super simple. I'm going to choose Georgia as the serif font and Arial as the sans serif one. You could try to choose different fallback fonts for each platform that you're targeting, but then you start wading into the murky waters of trying to detect what fonts are installed at runtime, and that's probably not worth the effort. The whole purpose of a fallback is functional. It's to allow your users to still read your content in bad network conditions. In that sense, as long as it's legible, it's fine. The next step is to figure out the CSS properties to make one font render the same size as the other so that when we transition between them, the content doesn't jump around. Thankfully, there's a tool for that as well. It's called Font Style Matcher by Monica Dinkalescu.
It lets you play with these CSS properties by dragging them and seeing their effect. Line height and font weight are the obvious ones, but letter spacing and word spacing are the ones that really fine tune the output. Let's switch to Cormorant Garamond and tune the fallback to match. Thankfully, it's on Google Fonts, so this tool will simply fetch it for us. We start by setting up our target font. We could be super precise here, copying the values from some particular usage of this font on our page, but it's probably more effort than it's worth. We're just trying to calculate how these two typefaces relate to each other, so we can just pick indicative values. Since we're using this for headers, 32 pixel bold with our default line height is fine. I'm just going to zoom out a little so we can see a bit more of the page as we work. The first thing is to set the line height to be equal. Here it's specified in pixels and so matching it up is easy, but later on we'll convert that back to relative units. Then let's match the font size. Georgia has a larger X height, its lowercase letters are bigger for a given font size, and so we find that it looks about right at 26 pixels, about 20% smaller. We're using font weight 700 on our target, but Georgia's bold is far too heavy, so we can leave it at 400. Now we just need to get the spacing the same by tuning letter spacing. Now we can see the whole paragraph lines up pretty perfectly. And if we click this button, we can see what the transition is going to look like when the new font appears. And it's pretty good. The text moves around a little bit, but not wildly so, which is what we're after. Repeating that process for Arial and HK Grotesque, we can see that the two fonts are a lot more similar by default. Arial is a bit heavier with a slightly larger X height, but we get a pretty good result just by tweaking word spacing. Again, the new font popping in is noticeable but not jarring, so I think this is good. So, now we have a bunch of properties that we can set on our fallback text to make it look more similar to the finished page. But how exactly can we apply these styles? Well, that depends a lot on how you've architected your CSS. If you write CSS that looks like this, where each selector describes all the typographical properties that apply to an element, the changes to the CSS are fairly straightforward. You simply duplicate your declarations and inject different properties until the fonts have loaded. The problem, of course, is that you have to do this for every rule that sets these properties, and new styles have to be written with this optimization in mind. So while it's okay in terms of simplicity, it's a bit laborious and potentially error prone. You can improve things dramatically by placing the logic in something like a SAS mixin, and then enforcing that you only ever set typographical rules by calling that mixin, letting SAS worry about generating the correct CSS. It's definitely an improvement in terms of process, but the CSS that it outputs can be large and you might introduce problems with specificity. Still, I've personally used this pattern and it holds up pretty well. Another common CSS architecture is to use atomic classes that only set a single property. This means that you only have properties defined in a single place, but class names are repeated all throughout your document. For techniques like this, this approach works really well. And so we'll finish today by seeing it in action in our demo. The point being that there's no one-size-fits-all approach to this sort of thing. It turns out trying to change typography across your entire site all at once is somewhat of a stress test for your CSS architecture. So don't worry too much if you can't get every instance just right. The important thing is to avoid showing your users a blank screen and tweaking the fallback font should only be done if your CSS can withstand it. Let's see it in action on our example from before. I've got the two CSS rules here to apply the web fonts once they're loaded, but I've also added an explicit fallback. I'm now setting Arial for the sans serif and Georgia for serif in the case where the web font hasn't loaded, and I'm using the not selector to achieve that. Using not in this way just means that we can add rules for the fallback that we know won't leak over to the finished page. I've also added a small bit of JavaScript to toggle the class names on the HTML element so we can quickly switch the fallback off and on. We can see that there's a fair bit of difference at the moment. The height of the title isn't so bad, but the text below wraps pretty differently. To fix this, we can apply the values we calculated earlier. For the body copy, we just need some negative word spacing. Now, when we toggle the font on and off, the words hardly move, which is perfect. Scrolling down, you can see our scroll position isn't jumping around as well. So if we were halfway down the page when the font loaded, we hopefully wouldn't have lost our place. Now, let's fix the header. Again, by just applying the values we calculated earlier. First, we can set the letter spacing and the line height because they apply globally to the fallback font. Then we can override the font weight of any bold serif elements on the page, setting them back to 300. And finally, we just need to reduce the font size of the two sizes that we're using on the page. These reduced sizes combine with the line height we set above to result in the same rendered height per line. 
And there we have it. Both fallback fonts are tuned to be as close as possible to the final rendered size, and the change is as small as possible. Running another snapshot, we can see just how subtle the change is when the two fonts load. This should hopefully help you make the case for displaying a fallback font rather than a blank page, and your users on spotty internet connections will thank you. As always, the code is online at this URL if you'd like to poke around. Thanks for watching. Just quickly before you go, I'd like to thank Look Ahead again for making this episode available. They hire software engineers and CTOs in Australia and are particularly involved in the JavaScript and React communities. They're a small team and I've known them all for years. They're literally the only tech recruiters in Australia I'd recommend and I can't recommend them highly enough. If you're new to the channel, Front End Center is a subscription screencast series for web professionals. If you'd like to support the channel and see the full collection, including the sequel to this episode, head over to frontend.center and subscribe. Or subscribe here on YouTube to get notified whenever more free episodes are released. Thanks for watching.